Okay, uh, welcome back. Um, I uh, have in the insane honor of introducing my friend Matt Dupuy, who I think is the best roofing person on the planet. He's I know. a Bachelor of Science, a Master of Science, and a Doctorate from the uh, University of, of, of Wisconsin. But what some of you don't know is that um, Matt served in the military. He was a, a ranger and then was involved in a group that I'm not allowed to mention. Um, and so he's spectacular. So thank you, Dr. Dupuy. He, uh, he also has a, a wicked sense of humor that I think he picked up from uh, a relative called Renee. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, thank you, Joe. Good morning, everybody. Um, as what Joe forgot to mention is uh, I am the second generation of doing this. Those have been at uh, summer camp for many, many years. Uh, my father, Renee, presented here, and I think it was seven or eight, and that was, he was of the vintage that I had to do as PowerPoints. That's fine, that's fine. I enjoyed doing it. I learned by doing his PowerPoints. But that was the largest PowerPoint presentation I ever put together was for that summer camp session. And he's just like, oh yeah, you pull in everything. I, I want to talk about this and that. And we always called him the train wreck. So <laughs> I want to show a lot of carnage. Show the train wrecks. Okay, I'll, let me dig files and find those photos. So I, I got a chance to speak here in 2017 on concrete roof decks. And Joe likes to quote my father on one thing, that rocks don't burn. When you're talking about fire testing and fire ratings, that rocks don't burn. Okay, agreed. The thing I mentioned in 2017 that seems to have stuck was that you can always tell who the architect is in the room by looking at the shoes. So if you're an architect, look down at your feet. <laughs> one of these people is the general contractor and one is the architect. I, I sent this picture to Joe, I said, and I asked that same question, which one is the architect? So yes, that seems to be one of uh, Matt's law or something, is that the person with the pointiest shoes at the table is the architect. So at the construction trailer, you can always look down and go, there they are, okay, I know. <laughs> The architects are over on that side of the table. So I threw this in here real quick before I get to my presentation for Peter Baker. Yesterday he, he kind of said, I had this one job that didn't go well and I, I feel bad about it. Well, this is my castle. I put every nickel I have into this place in 21. Now I'm a building science nerd like you guys and a licensed engineer and if I didn't watch over this like a hawk, right? So Joe has his Porsche, and he loves his Porsche, and you know, that's his baby. My baby is my home theater. I'm, I'm a big home theater nerd, I love it. So this is the extra deep foundation to make the headroom for the theater, with a wing wall and everything. And it was super hot this day, and yes, the gentleman in the lower right-hand corner is actually in his underwear. He stripped down, he's like, it's so hot, man. He stripped down his underwear. I'm like, really? Okay. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, proper safety gear and everything. So this is the inside, okay? Double walls, mineral wool, multiple layers, green glue, 10,000 watts, 140 de decibels. Nice theater. That, on March 6th, 2022, is the sump pump. Where is it going? Down into the ground. Now, I didn't think anything of it. Now, we still don't know if the landscaper or the irrigation guy did that. But I missed this. Yeah, hey, Peter, how are you feeling now? I was in the theater 
when the what? What's that? I I was in there. I was watching a movie. There may have been some edibles involved or something. <laughs> and I was and I was just sitting back while you're enjoying the movie. And I looked down at the floor, and the screen is reflecting up at me. I'm like, what? The, you know, I'm br uh, unreclined, squish, squish. Oh, fuck. I'm running around. Finally found the problem. Cut the pipe. The thing ran for three and a half hours pumping. It's probably 10,000 gallons of water and 60 grand of damage. Yeah. The sump, okay. It was, the sump pump is supposed to go to daylight. And, and when it pumps, it's supposed to go out. The irrigation or the landscaper ran the sump pump to height, so it was because it was a pretty house for show and a pr tr trade show. They ran it to the empty lot next door and just left it. And over the, we moved in Halloween, and over the winter, I figured the sump pump pipe sank into the mud and was plugged with mud. So now there is a, instead of a one-third horsepower, there's a full horsepower, a battery backup sump pump, there is a Generac backup for the whole house, and we dug down to that wing wall and ran clear stone down to daylight, because the lot slopes, anyway. So, Peter, I pooched this, this I, I the contractors did, but I, I should have caught that. That hurt. Why am I blank? Come on. There we go. So this is what I'm here to talk about today. We're on subject now. We're here to talk about train wrecks. This is a carnage. This is, the last presentation was a lot of numbers and graphs. This is just going to be a lot of fun, and don't do this. Well, I'm just saying, these are the things. All right, I would say half my work is forensics and legal. So like Joe, you know, you find yourselves in courts and um, I always joke, people don't call when things are going well. Um, so even though my company does design, we do a lot of large projects and, and waterproofing and roofing, I personally get involved in a lot of train wrecks. Things have already gone wrong. The other half of what I do is research. So. I play in the lab and out in the field, and I go do this. So these are what we're going to talk about. So in 2017, I came here and talked about concrete roof decks. This is still an issue. Uh, we have moved forward. But the, we know a lot more than we did, but we do not have a silver bullet yet. Um, there are some companies touting, oh, I got a magic product that will stop vapor in its tracks. Mm -hmm. The NRCA, the National Roofing Contractors Association, did some testing with concrete treated and untreated with some of the vapor reducing admixtures, and in fact, testing showed it increased the E96 transmission of vapor. And I was just like, yeah, you're doing the, it stopped liquid water, but it didn't, it actually increased vapor transmission. So, and that's published in the NRCA's Professional Roofing Magazine. Um, done a lot of research. So what we've found and what I'm here to tell you is that with your concrete roof decks, it's not a floor inside the building. It sits outside. So yes, the roof starts to dry down, the concrete starts to dry, but then it rains. And then it starts to dry. And then dew. And then high humidity. And so to catch that roof when it's way down here with low moisture content with, by roofing over it, is difficult for the, con I mean, it's, it's guesswork on the contractor, it's dumb luck. Some roofs, like contractors will go, I, I roofed over that last month and it worked. Or, you know, two, three years ago we did this, it worked just fine. Um, so the source of the moisture we found is all these exterior weather conditions. And so how do you keep a roof deck, you know, 50,000 square foot roof deck, from being rained on. We can build a roof over it to let it dry. It just, it's not practical. Um, so we've pretty much come up with a, we've retreated to a position which we'll finalize with, but uh, lightweight structural concrete versus regular weight structural concrete. 
Lightweight is still more of a problem. It arrives with twice as much water inside of it already. And then it behaves a little different. The two concretes behave a little differently. So uh, the 2018 work, I uh, worked with Dr. Straub and Dr. Schumacher up in Canada. Uh, the 2018 work was to, and I know some people are going to chuckle, but we need to validate it in this application. We need to validate the Woofy model for use in roofs over concrete decks. And so I let John and Chris take care of all the hydrothermal characterization of the concrete, which was an undertaking unto itself, and they did incredible work. Um, and we took care of validating the model in our lab. So this is some of the pictures. They, we sent them regular weight and lightweight concrete. This is regular weight and lightweight structural concrete. This is not ins lightweight insulating concrete. And so they're chopping up uh, into little bits to do all of their hydrothermal characterization. In our lab, we built actual roofs with polyisocyanurate insulation, instrumented the hell out of them. Um, you see them encapsulated. We are heating them from below. We are pushing the vapor drive on these things because we obviously want to speed it up. Um, if we let them sit in the lab, the moisture would move, but it would move slow. So we're heating them from below to increase the vapor drive across the vapor. So half of these roofs had vapor retarders, half did not. Half were lightweight, half were red. Half had a strip form, half had a... So we're trying to capture all the conditions, you know, that 2K factorial study. Yay. Um, so in 2017, somebody s stood up to the mic and said, well, we know Woofy is inaccurate. Why would you use such a thing on, on a roof? And Joe came to my defense and said, no, no, no. This is solid state movement. We're not talking about air movement in a roof. This is solid state concrete, solid state roof with and its... This is what Woofy was made for. This is what Woofy predicted versus what actually happened in the lab for a steel deck with a vapor retarder with lightweight structural concrete. Pretty damn good, right? Yeah, I, yeah it works. Um, and the, I'm sorry, uh, the, the left axis, it, so we had high, these tiny little rotronic, they're the size of a matchstick. Uh, inserted at different levels in the roof so we could watch the moisture move. And um, there's a whole thick thing I produced the NRCA if you're really interested in seeing what, how. But left side is relative humidity, bottom is cumulative hours. And so I think it's 8,700 hours in a year or something like that. So we're, this is, we did a full year. These things sat for a full year in our lab cooking. And that's with a vapor retarder. Without a vapor retarder, any guesses? Whoops, go forward, not backwards. <laughs> but again, Wolfie predicted it almost to the damn hour. I mean, it was really impressive how well it worked. I'm sorry. So this is with a vapor retarder at the end of one year, we're cutting it. Just we're, we're dissecting these roofs and, and decommissioning the study. So th that facer, that's not what we want to see, but that's what we expected because we are pushing vapor it's hitting the TPO. This is a TPO roof membrane. And so the facer is getting moist. This is without a vapor tartar after one year. Musty smell, some biologic growth going on. It's been wet for probably nine mo uh, 10 months or something. I mean, it's, this is what we run into in the field, which has triggered this kind of concern. Yes, sir? Is, it, is that insulation under the... Correct. That is the facer, the... Glass, no, this is, this is direct bonded to polyisocyanurate because this is, if I get out, you know, someone call, hey, we got a roof, that's fit. This is why. Now, gypsum cover boards don't fare much better in this situation. Now, high, uh, high density polyiso with coated glass facers doesn't care. It's a honey badger. <laughs> honey badger don't give them. About moisture. So just to show you what we kind of have. So we've done other work uh, 2015 where we looked at the facers themselves, moisture content versus strength, coated glass versus paper. Um, 
it's, in, it's out there in the internet. Um, and so we knew the tar red line is the target for where we know paper faced polyiso loses, you know, really starts turning a corner to lose its strength. So in Nashville, we stay below, it gets close, but we stay below the red line. No, it, I thought, so I ran them to 10, it, level, it send, levels out. So you just hit this um, balance, this equilibrium, the hydrothermal equilibrium. If we don't use a vapor retarder, I, I mean, just like, yeah, this is what we're seeing in the field. Yes? Where is the vapor retarder in the center? So, I'm sorry, the, the vapor retarder will be applied directly to the concrete deck. The question was, where is it in the assembly of the cross section? Vapor retarder is right down on the concrete deck, and that's, think of it as a, as a throttle. You know, we know the moisture is, we call it a vapor retarder in our vapor barrier. Water is, water molecules are going to get through. We're just using a strong vapor retarder, um, an SBS, a modified bitumen base sheet. It's usually th thick enough to meet what we're looking at. So in Miami, Florida, see where the red line is? The vapor drive, it's a di you know, different climate, different vapor drive. What we found is in zones one and two, you can get away with no vapor retarder. And that's why generally we're seeing problems up north where we, you know, we have this, but you go far enough south and the overall vapor drive to the, is to the interior enough that that's even without a vapor retarder. We're still fine in Miami. So we learned a lot from the Woofie. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people are like, well, that's not what we want to know, the magic number. Well, there isn't a magic number because of all that upsy-downsy, when do you roof? When it's up here or when it's down here, and how do you know? Yes? Just to clarify that, the moisture comes from the concrete, not from the interior. Correct. The, answer, the question was, is where is the moisture sourced from that I'm talking about? This is moisture stored in the concrete roof decks. Say again? <coughs> so, two different, a question, was it during the curing process? Concrete has two processes going on simultaneously. The chemical process of curing and the hydrothermal process of drying. So, curing of concrete deals with the structure and its strength and is a chemical process that technically never stops. The University of Wisconsin, we've got cylinders that are like 100 years old now. We've been testing them every couple years and they're still gaining strength. Ooh. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I just, they made a big deal of it in the paper. I'm just like, yay, okay, we know, con you know, concrete just gets stronger. Not, I mean, it's asymptotic, so it's, you know, it's not gaining a ton, but still, the chemical reaction is still going on, but drying of the concrete is what we're dealing with here, the moisture leaving the concrete. That's our problem out there. So, here's, here's where we are in the roofing industry in general. If you're gonna go over concrete, specify coated glass facers on the polyiso. Do not specify paper facers. Paper facers do not lock, like moisture. So if it gets up there, where is the bond? All right, think of the chain between the roof deck and the roof membrane. When the wind uplift comes and pulls, where's a failure gonna happen? At the facer. The paper facer fails first, Almost always. If we have a gypsum cover board, same thing can happen. Uh, it's just it's similar to drywall. Once it gets so wet and, it, and the summer comes and dries it out, it physically never recovers. It, it does not have a reversible cycle where you can dry gypsum back out. It crumbles and swells and then crumbles. It's, and so again, the membrane's just sitting there flapping in the wind and the owners talk, you know, get my lawyer and Everyone's showing up with their insurance company and lawyer. Uh, these are with fully adhered, excuse me, we never use the term fully. It's an adhered membrane system. <laughs> I'm, I, you think I'm joking. There's been lawsuits. There have been lawsuits over that one word. And so in the roofing lexicon, you will not find fully adhered anywhere. Correct. I'm saying, though, in ASTM 1079, uh, the NRCA definitions, anywhere where we would define such a term, fully adhered does not exist. An adhered roof system, yes. So, never use water-based anything. Lordy how people, architects, have tried 
We're going for lead platinum, so we're going to specify water-based primer, water-based adhesive over this concrete deck. And they're literally using shovels like a Zamboni to push the roof off because it just turned the adhesives and everything turn right back into snot. They remulsify, soften, and they just the membranes in the parking lot, and the lawyers are lining up at the front door. All right, vapor retarders are your friends. The good old fashioned two ply built up roofing system, mopped asphalt, still works, still awesome. Uh, just people s more and more hate the smell of a kettle. Not me, I, that's, a, that's a smell of money. Um, <laughs> that's what roofers all, ah, it smells like money to me. Yeah, it's a, um, if you've never had a kettle chicken, I'll, ask me tonight. Um, <laughs> So cold adhesives, uh, for we're going to see in the next section, cold adhesives for vapor retarders are an incredible thing. Um, chemically, they are insanely strong. Um, you can vent these roofs. There are manufacturers, uh, if any are in the room, I'm sure, that have a vented system. More of them are coming to the market where you either stand and fight the moisture with a vapor retarder or you let it out. Just, you know, yeah, get out of here. And you vent the system. Both of them can work. Um, the, we call them suck down systems. It's a trick of physics uh, where it's a one way vent. The faster the wind blows over, the valves open and let the pressure out, keeps the membrane down. And guess what? Vapor pressure pushes them open too so they can vent and lets moisture out. It can work. Modeling it, I, I, maybe I need to talk to Chris and John again about modeling, but. Uh, Figuring out how the the venting rates and how often it's going to be hard, but we know it. We've anecdotally we know it works from the field, so we can vent them. Um, you can put lightweight insulating concrete over the top of these. Roofing industry has been using lightweight insulating concrete for decades, back into the 70s um, at least, and so we know how to deal with the moisture. We know what to do with it. And we have the products, so you can put it right over the top, and they'll t deal with the moisture that way. Um, well, the flooring industry has approved test methods. There is no standardized, approved ASTM or otherwise moisture con content test for concrete in the field for a roof deck. Drilled in, we've tried drilled in probes. We've got uh, impedance meters, resistance meters. We've tried all of them. Uh, they all have their issues. There is a new probe that just rolled out a couple months ago. I just got it a couple weeks ago. I haven't played with it yet. Maybe the answer, stay tuned. Um, surface profiles. Roofers, manufacturers, and general contractors getting a lot of tussles over this. The iCry chips. These, I should have thrown a picture of them in here. They are, they are rubber chips that show, one through 10, that show different profiles of the concrete surface. Uh, broomed versus uh, floated, mag float, wood float, broomed. All of them produce different surface profiles, and so specifying by the iCry chips that you shall produce a, a three or four surface or a five or six, whatever you know, whatever you want to specify, it gives everybody something to you know aim for that they that both parties know what you're expecting. So there's the uh, iCry chips out there, uh, legal potholes. We're going to litigate this one August 15th, it starts. Uh, situation where the roofer knew. I, I know this woman very well. For years, she called, hey, you know, give me the article. I, she sent them all the articles. She sent them warnings from the trade associations. Don't do this. You, you know, moisture and roofs. She sent it all in. The architects have emails going back and forth where they're going, oh, uh, Boy, what the roofer point makes a good point. We should put a vapor retarder. Well, it's not in the budget. Well, let's let the general contractor decide. It's a means and methods. No, it's not a means and methods. It's a design. Use a vapor retarder. Don't use a vapor. That's a design. So then the GC said, ah, we're not going to do it. We don't have time in the schedule. So the roofer warned them. And, it's, and so now the roof's out in the parking lot, figuratively. Only half of it failed. Um, so, I mean, it, you see the situation. The roofer warned them, hey, this is going to happen. 
look at all these industry articles and stuff saying we shouldn't be doing this. And she got forced into it anyway, meaning the general co contractor sent her letters saying you will perform or else. And they're like, okay, we warned you. They went ahead and she failed, meaning the roof. Um, and we're, gonna, we're, we're going to arbitration. So, yep, I already said many articles. The National Roofing Contract Association has a lot, is basically a good hub for information on this. If you're looking for, you know, a specific issue, every manufacturer at this point in history has a preferred system or a method they prefer to deal with roofs over uh, concrete decks. Now, this can, uh, this can also be an issue not just with uh, new construction, guess what else has popped up? Re-roofing. If you have a leaky wet roof that you're tearing off, what happened to that concrete deck? It soaked up the water, and we're gonna rip off the old roof, and in one day they're gonna tear off and put back. Okay, was that enough time for that moisture to dry out of the concrete? No. That's the right answer. Everyone's shaking their No. So, you need to consider what you're tearing off. If it's just uh, falling apart physically, but it's fairly dry, probably okay. But if you've got, if you're going up there with infrared, nuke, uh, impedance, whatever you're doing a roof scan with, and you're finding big areas of wet, you should consider vapor retarders. Okay, vapor retarders and concrete roofs. Ooh, same topic. But as soon as we started saying, meaning the industry, hey, you need a vapor retarder, um, questions were raised. Will they adhere? The favorite vapor retarder today and probably in the near future for many contractors is a peel and stick, a self-adhering sheet, 40 mil, 48 mil, modified bitumen, so it's asphaltic. It has a very good or decent vapor retarding perm rating. But questions were raised about it long-term adhesion. So we were asked to test some of this stuff because as part of the 2018 work we did in our lab, remember what I said, we put down a torch applied SBS modified bitumen to an ASTM D41 primed deck and that son of a bitch was stuck, all right? these were gray-haired roofers that have been doing a long time and you got a whole bunch of consultants, everyone's just like, yep, it's adhered, it's stuck. So we let it sit for a year. I told you, we decommissioned these things. Came right up like a post-it note. We thought we had the, the gold standard of vapor retarder adhesion and that foot and left of frame, that is my God rest his soul father. He was standing atop when I said, yeah, here, let me just tear this corner up. And the whole thing came up as one big chunk. And he's up there going, sorry, it's funnier you had to be there. Um, <laughs> watching him cuss and swear at me like I did something wrong. <laughs> and he's the one standing up there just, you know, on something, whatever. But the thing came up and all of them, not just one, not just the lightweight, not all of, all of our fall four paper tartars came up like a post-it note and it, it raised eyebrows, drew concern. So the NRCA ordered up some testing. As I said, the most popular product type is self-adhering. So it was all about the self-adhering membranes. Um, we let them cure for 28 days just because that's the number everyone uses. It's a civil engineering thing. We applied the vapor tartars and let them dwell, sit in the lab. Guess what we did? Half of them got uh, lab temperature, the other half got warm from the underside. We're going to try and create some vapor pressure. So half of these, oh no, this is all regular weight, sorry. We didn't use any lightweight in this one because we were just interested in the results and the impact of the vapor pressure push on them. So this is the different, we, different products. Use, let's see, that's the BOR on the right and then Product A, B, C, and D. It doesn't matter who the manufacturers are per se. Um, this is a 12 inch by 12 inch bonded plate test. So this is a bonded plate we're doing on a Kemper system somewhere else in the country, but the same rig. Uh, has a capacity of 2,000 pounds. 
So you could have one ton per square foot of uplift. Not bad. Um, and this is basically the failure mode. So what you, what you do is you cut around the plate and then you tug on it until she fails. And so when this happens, you get, these are called filaments. When we get the filamenting and it fails, you got a number. This is what it typically looked like. Um, the pink is the primer and the black is the self-adhering. Uh, that's an SPS one. Interestingly enough, two different manufacturers had the same primer just in different buckets. Hmm. Little relabeling. Um, regardless, there's the results. Um, it, it wasn't unexpected. Um, in general, it's still a hell of a lot of uplift. So we, this, this was kind of a, a miss, a red herring. We don't have as big a problem as we thought. Uh, we do lose strength over time and from vapor pressure, but it is not as bad, you know, we're still well over what any windstorm could produce in terms of uplift. I mean, 318 PSF of uplift. That's way beyond any windstorm on this planet. And the bar at the top there generally did the best. But the interesting one's the number four. It gained strength. Something happened there, but that over the, I'm guessing the heat, you know, activated more to get in and grab some more, just a little bit. We call that mechanical interlock. I spent two years of my dissertation time studying adhesion and gave up because I was going to need a degree in physics, chemistry, um, statistics. And I was just like, nope, I'll go do something else. Um, but I read a lot of books and a lot of paper on adhesion. So the question is, does the surface profile, the eye cry chips, remember I said different profiles, does that affect adhesion? Probably. I'm not, maybe that's the next test. I can't speak to that, but yes. There, the one thing I can tell you is we as a race, humans, we don't know why post-it notes stick to the wall. I'm not kidding. We don't know if it's weak electron bonding, valence forces, mechanical interlock where the, the, the viscous adhesive goes in and grabs, or it's a combination thereof. There's eight, I think I counted eight competing theories. The chemists just know, yeah, if I add a little more, you know, X, Y, Z, I get some cold weather performance. The mixologists know how to make the adhesives work at 3M and BASF and these other places. They know how to make it do what they want to, it to do. But exactly why in the physics, the quantum mechanics or whatever, we don't know. So back on target, all of this was published by Mark Graham, the technical director of the NRCA, uh, a couple months ago. And there's the title of the article, if anybody wants to go, it's free on the web. Um, I accidentally made a sixth set. Don't ask me how I did it. I went to the lumber yard, picked up the lumber to make the forms. I accidentally made a sixth set of forms. And so I had, and the guys showed up with the truck and they're like, we can fill it. So we filled it. And so I called up one of my friends at Suprema, said, hey, you've been talking about this coal ply EF product for a long time. I want to try it. So they sent me a bucket and, you know, a roll of SPS base sheet. And we put it down, and it is the honey badger of vapor retarders, or I should say of, of adhesion. Uh, we stopped because the test frame, we were just like, nope, 1900, 1950, nope, we're done. I'm not going to break this thing over trying to see if we can make it fail. It approached one ton per square foot of adhesion, wet or dry. So right now at, at my company, if we need a mission critical vapor tartar, it is not inexpensive, but it works like a son of a gun. I'll give it that. All right, drying a wet roof. This ought to be interesting. So is Andre here yet? No? Okay. Oh, back in the corner. Okay. So, not to pick on you, Andre. I love you. You've done some incredible work and still are. But he was, to the best of my knowledge, he was back there at Oak Ridge in the 80s working on the self-drying roof concept. This was back, uh, I'm trying to remember, there was the Moist program. Before that was the STAR program, I think it was called. Programmed in Fortran. Um, I'm, I'm not kidding. Is, that's... But what we had in the 70s and 80s, we would go, 
uh, cut a roof in the summer, everything would be fine, it'd be dry. Now these are built up roofs, old asphalt. They'd have like an inch, inch and a half of compressed fiberglass in them. They were not the thick rafts of insulation we had today. Well, if we went and cut that same roof in February, it'd be soaking wet. And then we'd come back and cut it again in the summer, and it'd be dry, and everyone's going, what the is going on? How is, you know, and so they looked into it, it was a self-drying roof. Moisture would come in, condense in the winter, and then the summer sun would push it out, and so, and it was impervious, or it didn't really care about the cyclic behavior of wetting and drying, wetting and drying. That's just what they did. And they took it and kept on performing. Um, this is not what we're talking about here. This technology originated in Europe, or this concept, I should say. It's not technology so much as a concept. Uh, we take desiccated, heated air, and force it through a roof system with an intake and exhaust, so exhaust fans drawing it, and so we can dry a wet roof out. And so you, you cut ports on either side. This does not happen overnight. It takes days and weeks to dry this roof out. Uh, they, mo they have monitors on either side watching the grains of water going in, grains of water coming out, uh, and it's, it, it works. Now, some roofs are better candidates than others. If we have an adhered roof system that is adhered all the way down to the, the deck, or like a concrete deck, can we get air through that roof system very easily? No, because there's just levels of adhesive and not many gaps. Um, but we st it still can be done. Air moves through pretty much any roof, but there are better roofs than others. And so there's a company trying this as a business model uh, in the U.S. here. Uh, this is in Oregon. We had a, this is, there was a mission critical room underneath this roof. The roof was soaking wet over a concrete deck, and it was a hospital, but they just couldn't tear the roof off without great expense, and so they said, well, why don't you guys try and dry this thing out? So the company brought in one of the desiccations, and you can see the ports plugged into this roof. It's a ballasted EPDM roof, a very good candidate because we have no adhesives in there, no mechanical fasteners. It's loose laid. There's the exhaust with a, uh, the moisture trap in it, so if water condenses, it doesn't get sucked into the fans. And then there's just an overall, this little, this, this one room underneath was just critical for the hospital. They couldn't afford to tear off the roof and, and stop using the room. So they're trying to dry it out such that it could continue its, you know, repair the leaks and dry it out. Interesting concept. Um, I just thought that'd be interesting to this group. I was just invited to come play. Uh, I have no stake in this whatsoever. It was just like, hey, we're doing this. You want to come see it? Yes, I want to see this. So I flew out to Oregon and hung out with these guys for a couple days. If you're interested, there's, you get a hold of the Polygon group. There, it's an interesting concept, but it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Historic renovations. Um, there's a, uh, an aquarium, one of these big aquariums somewhere in the country, but the roof is wet over the aquarium but if they tear the roof off, they got to move all the fish and the dolphins, manatees, or whatever. So they're talking about trying to dry it instead of tear off the roof. All right, this one you're going to love. Came for carnage. Here's the carnage. I hate to say this, but one of you energy consultants caused this. Maybe I don't hate to say it, but I grin as I say it. Um, so, past 10, 15 years, there's been a pressure in the U.S. for affordable housing, and so they're, they're trying to build as many apartment buildings and apartment complexes, multifamily, excuse me, multifamily complexes as fast as they can, and let's be honest, as cheap as they can. So, what they've done, and the, what I see over and over again, is platform construction, wood stud frame, uh, parallel cord trusses, stud wall, trusses, stud wall, parallel cord trusses, all the way up to the roof, whether it's three stories, six stories, um, and I've seen a couple iterations now with insulated concrete forms on the exterior, but still using wood trusses. And so they form the roof deck with parallel cord wood trusses. Normally, we would go to the 
uh, IECC tables and go, okay, we're in zone whatever, we need R20, R30, R whatever, and get rigid board insulation and put it on top of the roof, right? Oop, wrong way. So a warm roof, we put the insulation above the sheathing. Because when we get to the roof deck, we got to put OSB down. Cold roof is on the left there. Somebody thought, well, there's a fire code provision about this attic space, this plenum space that's created that says you have to sprinkler it, or if you blow it solid with insulation, you don't have to sprinkler it. So, yeah, I hear some groans, and you, you, the light bulb went, oh, God, I get what's going wrong. Um, there's the catch. In this plenum space, they do that. And you, you, you guys think that it's one building. Dozens and dozens, I mean, probably over 100 buildings in my state alone were built like this. Um, in one deposition, the very first one that happened in Milwaukee, uh, the architect was forced to cough up a list of buildings they designed like this. They coughed up a list of 22 buildings in the state of Wisconsin that they had designed just like that. The lawyers used it like a shopping list. <laughs> every single one they've litigated, every single one is rotten. Um, so this is just a sample one. So this is what this looks like on the roof. You just have a couple penetrations, interior drains. This is a white TPO standard. And, and we've tried, they've tried the excuse of, well, we specified a black EPDM roof and it wound up being a white TPO. Therefore, that's why it condensed. Uh-uh, doesn't work. That argument's been tried. So it's well established. Everyone uh, talks about it. And we're going to see, it doesn't matter whether it's flex duct or metal duct, uh, it leaks. Whether it's 1% or 15%, it leaks. There's guides and literature published by the Department of Energy has been chasing leaky ducts in attic spaces for years, decade. Um, so we just accept that it leaks. And so as you can imagine, the moisture goes into that confined space, which is blown fiberglass, which is what, 96% air or something? Does it provide any resistance to vapor movement? Nope. Where does it go? First condensing surface, that OSB above it. And the OSB is probably two degrees warmer than the air temperature, if, because um, there's zero insulation above it. There'll be a, a sheet of gypsum cover board just to meet a fire code, and that's it. And so a lot of depositions, a lot of reports have been written already for the past 10 years. We, this isn't going away. Um, I, they just keep coming in the door. And it's gotten to the point with the local consultant clan that we meet up on the roof for the joint inspection. And it's like, hey, Matt. Hey, Tom. Another one? Yeah, same thing. You know, you're just going to change the title on the report? Probably. Because um, it's, it's literally, I mean, we're joking, but, you know. And we, we've had that, that quote at the bottom where the, the lawyer, well, my, my client had, had the right to assume these would be built properly and there would be no leakage. And it's just like, no, you didn't. Um, that, that was, and that didn't fly either. So, yeah, that's what the underside of the OSB looks like. If any of you have ever walked on a uh, too thin of ice, walk out in the lake, it's a little too thin, that's what it feels like. It's crunching under your feet as you're walking. I'm not a light guy. They usually let me go first. Um, <laughs> you, you know, test the ladder and you test the roof. Yeah. And so it's a very unsettling feeling when it gives way and all that's holding you up is the roof membrane. You, you, you start doing the dance um, and then you take a crayon and don't step here. Um, it's just a minefield. Because, yes? Yes, sir. Yes. So the question is, uh, if you go to manufacturers' websites and you look at, you know, so many R50 blown insulation, there is an expectation that it will settle over time. So there is an airspace, typically, not always, 
when we open it up, we find a couple inches of airspace. Not always. Occasionally, we found it where the insulation, the insulator, okay, they screwed up. Where the, the, you can tell the guy just stuffed the hose up there and missed an entire corner of the of the apartment. Um, let me show you a picture. I think everything will come together. So another picture of what we find typically. Once you strip the deck off, this is what it looks like. But that's what the contractors are doing, because that's the only place to put the ductwork, if you think about the cross-section of that roof. That's not the contractor. That's a design issue. Thank you. They're up here going, that's a design issue. Yes. And the architect, oh, I didn't show on my plans where the ductwork is supposed to go. They made that choice. <laughs> nah, nobody's buying that. Stop it. Um, so you'll have all the low voltage stuff up here. We've got bath. We've got plumbing vents running through here. We've got uh, bathroom fans. So, uh, yeah, uh, yes, sir. I was going to say, keep in mind that uh, NFPA allows the emission of sprinklers, you know, with uh, non-combustible material, but they also allow a two-inch airspace. They don't require that it all be. Oh, ag agreed. Yeah, and the, so you're always going to get that because the insulator's He's 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 making a comment about the NFPA and that it allows for a two-inch airspace potential, and but that's not the crux of the issue. Whether right. whether it's it's like we've had oh well, you didn't blow it full, that's why it condensed. No, whether it was R48 or R50 didn't make the difference here. Um, I'm, say, I'm saying lawyers sometimes make a deal of that, and it's like, no, that's not what's causing this. It's right here is what's causing this. What about vented or unvented? So, vented, the, question was, the question was, can we vent this airspace? And the answer is, not really. We don't have, uh, with a pitched roof, we've got buoyancy and hydric buoyancy, thermal buoyancy and hydric buoyancy driving it, plus wind. Here, we've got near nothing. I mean, unless you mechanically vent it, turbines and vent it mechanically, but then you're, you're forcing air leakage even worse. And the top floor is getting frozen out in northern climates. Yes, sir? I looked at uh, 35 of these in my climate zone and was consulted on 35. It cost the contractor $7 million. And one of the designers said, well, we think that fiberglass is settled a little bit. We'll just mount it. And I told them, no, you're going to bring dew point down to the, down to the face of the... All right. Yeah. They finally moved everybody out one by one, dropped all the drywall insulation, double treated for mold, encapsulated everything, then sprayed six to eight inches of closed cell. That's, this is what was done. So he was saying the long process, I'm not going to repeat exactly the process, but that's what was done here, is where they sucked out all the insulation, put spray foam down first, and then put insulation above deck, uh, trying to fix this problem. Just roll, I'm gonna keep things moving, because I got lots of slides, lots of carnage to go. Cody, you got a question? Sorry, I don't yeah. mean to. Yeah, just a, just a quick one, it's like, this is not a code compliant assembly, R806.5 or the equivalent in. I'll let you answer that after lunch. Okay. <laughs> I'm just saying, this is the result, and we know yeah. why the result is. And how do we fix it? Well, we go all the way back to that. How do we fix it? We put insulation above the deck. We have found to this point, we don't need to suck all the blown insulation out. We don't need to go in and try and fix all the air leakage. We just need to put insulation above the deck, and not even that much. We can get away with R5, R10, an inch or two of insulation. Um, let me keep moving here. We saw this. All right, yep. And I, I usually present this to roofing contractors and roofing insurance companies and the like. And the roofer, even though the roofer just built, you know, uh, Spear and Doctrine, built it just like it's supposed to be, they're still there at the table getting sued. Um, everyone goes, yeah, it's a design issue. The architect's going, oh, yeah, this might be my fault. Um, and their insurance company's going, shut up, shut up. Um, <laughs> Remember that one uh, architecture firm? I have no idea how they're still in business. Uh, 22 cases, each one costing approximately $2 million. 
how do you take that kind of loss and still are running, you know, how you still have your doors open? Because um, your insurance, pre your, the limit on your policy has got to run out at some point. Um, that, but we're seeing little variations of the scenario. I've got one of these where there is no vapor retarder in the ceiling whatsoever. East Coast Architect came into Wisconsin, designed design a building, a multifamily, big one. No vapor retarder in the ceiling, but they put R20 above deck, and it's fine, it's pristine. The problem we had there was uh, balloon construction. They, they framed from the top floor up to make parapets, and the air went right up there, condensed in the parapets, and is rotting out the parapets. So it's a slight variation. Um, but as it shows in the slide, R5 to R10, just an inch or two of insulation shown to protect the OSB in these situations. How do we know this anecdotally? And well, we can, Wolfie isn't so good at this because there's lots of convective stuff, but even if you take Wolfie and just throw some insulation off, it doesn't take much to protect it. Um, there are things on the roof, if you're not into, into roofs, called crickets. So in between two drains, the roofers will take tapered insulation to build slope. A even into a sloped roof deck, they will put a cricket on top, or a saddle. There are saddles and crickets, di different purposes, but they'll put those two things up on the roof to maneuver water to the drains, hopefully. Um, sometimes it don't go so well. We call those pondings. Um, yeah, but here's just more pictures of what we find. There's gypsum board that's ready to crumble. There's a foot that went through. I don't remember which one, might have been me, I don't know. Um, I put that in there because that's, it, you can tell moisture's been on that insulation. It looks like a brain. It, it, <laughs> if you get up close enough to it, you're just like, oh, oh, it just, and it smells. Okay, there's biologic issues going on here and mold remediation adding to the cost. But here's one of those saddles, pristine. This is the same roof as this, but it's under a saddle. All it took was a few inches of insulation or an inch even, even to the very edges of this thing. It's pristine, then all of a sudden it just goes to rotten. Um, so to correct the issue, all we have to do is put an inch or two up there and, and fix the damaged sheathing and encapsulating any mold, and it, that seems to be the fix. Yes, sir? Very, very quick question. What's been the time delay between construction to failure? So the time delay between construction and when we notice it, uh, I would say the closest one I've got is three years. There's one in the Green Bay area where the top floor residents started complaining about musty smell. And so they moved everybody out of the top floor and have been renovating it um, to get rid of the musty smell. And it's, it involves tearing the roof off. And I'll take two seconds on this. One of the best roofers in Wisconsin, the crew made a dumbass mistake. They put for, to apply adhesive, they put the membrane hanging, you know, they butterflied the membrane, which means they folded it over on itself and then they held it down with buckets of adhesive. Well, a storm front came in and a gust of wind came along. <laughs> Whipped those buckets of adhesive off the sixth floor. <laughs> the entire side of the building is peppered with yellow glue. Now their insurance company is involved. And I just, and I'm, I'm walking up to, I'm just like, what the happened here? And I go up there and the, the superintendent's still just sitting there smoking a cigarette. Just, I can't believe it. And he's like, ah. Oh. This is another fix, there's another way to do it. It's called a truss over. So we, so yes, you can do this. Uh, it, which one's more cost effective? I don't, you know, do the math and who, what kind of bids you get but you can put trusses over the top as long as you can structurally hold them, et cetera. Um, you know, it just looks like this, and there's still, they left the membrane in the deck in place. You can still see it right there, and they're gonna blow insulation in here just like a normal attic. And so you're shifting dew points, and they did the math. This can be done as well. So there are multiple ways to deal with this, 
But I would say, any, and I've heard of problems like this all the way down into Tennessee, Kentucky. So the Mason-Dixie line, you know, Rust Belt, whatever, north, this seems to be an issue. So, yeah, be on the lookout for that one. All right. I met up with Joe at a, a show in Iowa um, and told him about a project I was working on in northern Wisconsin. And I've gotten a lot of these prefabricated metal buildings. Um, are there any prefab building manufacturers here? Okay, I'm, I feel a little safer. Or you just don't want to, it, I didn't bring body armor. Um, so prefab metal buildings are typically a value proposition. They're very good cost per square foot. Um, they're typically rugged buildings. We use them in agriculture, um, automotive, like a lot of uh, maintenance shops. Uh, warehouses, and in the recent 10, 20 years, I've seen them, the, the manufacturers of these buildings have kind of shifted a little bit where they're able to dress these buildings up some more and make them into office spaces, light industrial. Yeah, we'll epoxy the floor and put some you know, drywall up, and uh, now you've got a very clean environment to, to build product in. And so they've gotten more, I don't want to say fancy, but they've gotten nice dress, they dress them up. However, the core concept still remains the same, how you build one. I haven't seen a church, someone said church, I haven't seen a church yet. But, okay, te in Texas we have church, the big mega churches, we, we bring in a thousand parishioners. Okay. So, okay, we make churches out of them too. Um, what's that? Faith-based roofing, okay. <laughs> Please, Lord, let our roof hold water tonight. Um, so the roof systems that are put on these are always structural standing seam roofs. Well, I should say almost always. I've seen our panel as well, which is an architectural. But in general, we put down structural standing seam. Um, before the roof goes on, though, from the underside, they'll put a poly liner on there. It'll typically be fiber-reinforced poly, uh, with sometimes with mylar or other combinations in there. But it's meant to be the vapor retarder and also hold the insulation. So we put, take fiberglass mats and they get crisscrossed. One goes in the purlins, one goes across the purlins. And then it winds up getting compressed and everyone gets excited. Um, but we still meet the energy code, continuous insulation, and there's even a, a line item for metal buildings. To, that's how you meet it. Um, and then you put the roof over the top of that, so you sandwich everything together. The problem is that one, the insulation sags a little bit. Just a little bit, you get like an inch of sag between purlins and straps. And you, so now you've got an airspace. The other problem is to hold the liner up, we've drilled hundreds or thousands of holes in it. Well, I, you giggle, but that's, that's the reality of how it's put together. And for a rugged, you know, mechanic shop or something, it's not a big deal. The problem is when you try and uh, put, what I've seen problem after problem with these buildings is when they put an unsophisticated HVAC system in this building. Just ceiling mounted uh, propane fire, uh, natural gas fired, you know, forest air heater. I'll hang two of these 100,000 BTU heaters and just flick the switch and go home for the night. And they just pressurize the building. And you got all these holes in it. Where does the air go? Doors, overhead doors, and through every little hole we've found. So this is what standing, in case you're going, what does he mean standing seam structural? This is a structural standing seam roof. Uh, typically 18, 24 inch pans, and they're they're bent with the seamer at the seams and that you can walk on these. This is what that liner looks like from the interior. This one happens to be a uh, garage for snow plows. So they bring the snow plows in covered with snow, kick on those heaters and go nap for a while. So we're dumping moisture into the air, we're dumping tons of heat and we're pressurizing it. Where does the moisture go? Yes, sir. Boy, I'd love if they'd balance the HVAC system. His question is, why is it pressurizing? 
it's, I said, these are typically very unsophisticated HVAC systems. Ceiling mounted heaters, or in this case, they had a giant, they literally had the heater at one end of the building and an exhaust fan at the other end of the building. And they were not balanced very well, and so they were, they were pressurizing the building. So the heater's pulling in outside air? Correct. It's, it's pulling outside air, heating it, and then shooting it in the building. And the buildings are going, you know, and you got all these tiny little holes. And where do they lead? Up into this cavity space. So here's, I grabbed this off the internet, like six websites had this image. So I'm like, well, I can use it too. Um, I'm, I called out where I got it, okay. Some manufacturer, thermal. But like I said, I found it like six other websites. I'm going, okay, this is a free for all. Um, but this is how it's assembled in general. You got your two different layers of fiberglass, the roof. They don't have the liner shown, but you saw it, it like I said, it's a self-adhering, so it sticks up to the underside of those purlins, and then they screw those straps in, these white metal bands, to hold the insulation up structurally. And so let me give you an example. I'll, I'll make a fancier building. I'll make an office building assembly. Let's put a drop ceiling in. Now we're going to screw another 10,000 holes for all the hangers for the grid system like this. What did we do? Poke more holes in the building. So he, this is uh, one of the, a corner with the strap, uh, probably not zoomed in enough, but you can see the condensation forming on just on that screw head. So this is in northern Wisconsin. It's an assembly. Uh, they do electronics assembly and manufacturing in here. So they actively humidified, keep it at 50%. That's the humidifier. You can barely see the, I tried to capture the mist. Um, but well, look, this is what, you know, they built it for this purpose and everyone knew. I said, yeah, well, you got a great vapor retarder, you'll be fine. Um, and so when I went up there the very day, it was minus 27 outside. And we're cranking this thing up to 50% relative humidity and like 70 degrees. And so I knew that it was not, yeah, that's the underside of the metal roof deck. Those are frozen. It doesn't leak, Joe, until the sun comes out. And then everyone goes, oh, the damn roof's leaking. It's not the roof. And we, we went looking for it. So I actually, the owner knew of Joe and called Joe, and Joe said, you know, get a hold of Matt. And Matt said, Joe, this is a little, you know, it's not the roof that's doing this. There's something going on with air leakage and air, uh, uh, air loss and movement. So Joe got, hooked me up with uh, Colin and Gary at TEC, little wizards who can work what magic with pressure sensors. So these guys set up a data acquisition system in the building, pressure taps. So I got some pictures of it in a little bit, but they really should be doing the presentation on the data portion of this. I'm just giving you the basic high level of what's going on because I've seen this problem over and over and over again buildings, finally figured out what was going on. So we were able to put pressure taps above that in that cavity space and down in the building, all over, you know, different rooms and by doors. And we watched it for a while while the HVAC worked. What we learned, the building had two furnaces with two thermostats. I'm not an HVAC person per se, but there's something called economizer mode, where one would kick in and the other one would go, oh, let me put some more air in. And so they're double, you know, they're both pushing and so not only do we have a humidified environment and a very cold environment, out exterior environment, we're overpressurizing the building and they're fighting, um, and we're just forcing air past this liner up against the roof. If I had to summarize everything, these metal buildings are great. I mean, when they're assembled correctly, they, keep, they, do, they function for decades and they work great. What we're finding is if you don't, to design the HVAC system correctly, you're asking for trouble. So I actually found a passage. I, apparently it's a fairly old, it's in the ASHRAE Fundamentals where they talk about vapor retarders and punching. I know Joe wrote an article about walking with golf spikes, but it's still 99% effective. 
but that's for vapor. For air pressure, we're killing ourselves. Um, so if we can figure out a way to gasket these holes or seal them better, it might, might help. So there's a picture of one of the pressure taps. So we're you know, checking the communication between the underside and above this liner. And what we're able to see is, yep, when we open a door over here, the pressure changes on this side of the building. It will confirm that the inside of the building is communicating pressure-wise with above this liner. So it's, it's an impressive case study if it ever gets written up, but nonetheless, it's showing that all of the holes in that up, and as an air barrier, this is for ABBA maybe, but not the Swedish supergroup, <laughs> air barrier folks, um, we, we've got that issue. So that's what appears to be happening here is unsophisticated HVAC systems unbalanced. Um, let's see, so there's pressure taps going to work, yep. So yep, I, I've got a handful of these things uh, some of them have settled out, and everyone blames the roof until we start showing, you know, with smoke and other th smoke, tracer smoke, that, yeah, look, air is going up from inside into your, this little cavity space. Um, and then suddenly the focus shifts from the roof to the HVAC, the liners, well, you didn't make this airtight, you missed tape here, and it becomes a nitpicking operation for the plaintiff going, oh, well, you didn't tape the... It here, it's sagging here. Well, you didn't maintain it, um, back and forth. So this internal sourced moisture is very difficult to trace. It's very difficult to fix afterwards. So I'm just saying from the experience I've seen in the field, if you work on or design one of these uh, prefabricated metal buildings, don't skimp on the HVAC. Make sure you've got it balanced to some degree or somehow to control it because it seems overpressurization is just killing these buildings. All right. Um, yep, the liner, it's working as, as a vapor tar, it's just air leakage. Okay, more carnage pick. Yes, in the back. I'll... So in your, in your picture, that's all To the purlins, yep. Correct. So, the, so he's pointing out, I, I don't fully understand what you're using, to be honest. He's using bandages. The, simpler, the one I've run into all the time is Simple Saver. Oh, there's a Simple Saver. Yes, that's a, a name brand, a type of this liner. Um, and apparently there's a long band system which is installed slightly differently. Um, every time I seem to be running into where there is numerous penetrations through this liner though, whether they're sealed or not, what we found every time, especially these, um, uh, don't ask me why, I keep getting these snowplow garages. They all have the same problem. We come in, we turn the heat on, we go home, and we come back. Now you're adding the, the desiccation of the salt in there too. Um, the, the truck full of salt. And they'll wash the truck before they go home. So floor is all wet, the snow's falling off, and they're f forcing heat. That's an interesting topic to look at, the exact different configurations. I'm speaking in generality, sir. So there's a question up here. I'll come back. You, yes, sir. Uh, I'll restart. Uh, so I think the, so two things. One, I think the, the 
the challenge is, as we talk about the plastic and the roof as a vapor barrier, when we really need to be talking about it as an air barrier, and thinking about the tapes and all the complicated interfaces that come with that and how real unrealistic that expectation is. Um, two, you focused a lot on the mechanical system being the driver, but I wonder if you wouldn't have the same problem, maybe just to a lesser extent, without the mechanical system just due to buoyancy. Hydric buoyancy and thermal buoyancy are possibilities, but as of late, I've been using differential manometers and checking doors and checking, and it's always like, you know, the door is just kind of staying open. You're like, eh. so I'm just, all the point I'm making here, folks, is that more attention needs to be paid to that HVAC and balancing. Um, yes, ma'am. Can you make it a warm roof and solve the problem at that point? But, so the question goes, it's kind of like the last system, can you throw some insulation on top and fix the problem? In general, yes, you can. Uh, however, metal buildings have, and I dealt with one in Ohio, snowplow facility, um, ODOT. Um, the problem became the edge details and where the insulate, so you got these metal wraps and fascia pieces that are hollow, and the air would leak out, and so you wound up, again, it came down to air control. So it's, we, I guess that's maybe where I need to go with this. This needs to be an air control layer as well, and, we're, and the contractors and designers are kind of, I think, are ignoring that, and then compound it with the HVAC. Joseph. So in the HVAC system, are you use, is this a recirculating HVAC system, and specifically with the um, snowplow garages, are they recirculating the air in there, or is it a single pass where it's coming through so they're using a direct fired makeup or something similar? Again, these are either ceiling hung HVAC, or so modine heater, you know, just. Okay, so that's a recirculating system. You're never taking air out of the building. They've also, I'm just saying, they've got fan, uh, makeup air units and fans. So everything is just, sorry to use the term, it's a dumb HVAC system. They just flick it on or off. It's not even thermos, barely thermostat controlled. In this one, this one, they had two 1 million BTU ceiling mounts. And so you're just making this huge thermocline of heat up there. And so to get it down here, the guy, you know, it must be 110 up here just to get it 50 degrees down here. You need floor heat. More sophisticated HVAC design. For the sake of time, I'm going to keep moving, Joe. Okay. okay. Uh, I can, I, I, I'll try and get as much as I can at the end. I'm here all day, folks. And I have lots more of these that I had to cut out. If we want to do a session tonight above the kitchen or something, I'm more than happy to go up there and do another PowerPoint tonight if anybody wants to join me with drinks. Well, um, the, the, the kitchen sucks, so it should be okay. Yeah. <laughs> so cold storage buildings. I love these. They're always so icy. Um, so what a, most designers just gloss over and roofers even sometimes forget. In a cold storage building, the vapor drive is reversed. The vapor drive is always into the building. So where do we need to stop the vapor? On the warm side, on the outside. Insulated metal panels do a good job of that. But I've seen whoa too many low slope roofs on these things where some dumb effing designer, not gonna name, use the A word, some designer puts vapor retarder on deck and we come back, open it up, because the building's at minus 10. What do you think's down on that sheet of, of vapor tartar? Ice. And the owner's flipping their mind. Why is there ice in my building? What the hell did you do? And now the roofer's involved because they just installed it like the plant said, and they're still getting sued. Um, air seals, and so proper design of these cold storage not only involves understanding that reverse design, but air seal, air seal, air seals. There are specific details for cold storage you would not use in a normal building that are paramount, and particularly with insulated metal panels. The edge detailing of IMPs to make these cold storage buildings is critical. 
If you want to make a bulletproof or if you have a difficult exterior environment, like in the tropics, if you're in Bermuda and you're trying to store uh, seafood, you don't build the building as cold storage, you build the cold storage inside of a building. You let the building be the envelope and you deal with the vapor and you know, temperature differentials inside the building. And please, leave like a foot or two. Do not build them right next to each other. That's another problem. I've got one of those in the Dakotas right now. A Little bit of moisture being generated because the wall is... All right, so air control is critical. Anytime we change temperature, we need air cut off, so we need to stop air moving from one temperature to another inside the roof. Um, so the, the HVAC contractor is always the natural enemy of the roofer. They will always put holes, they will drop their screwdrivers, they'll weld right on the membrane, they don't care. I watched a guy in, where was, was it Massachusetts? Somewhere here on the East Coast, he was dragging metal screens across the single ply membrane and just scratched, deep scratches, two of them, for like 250 feet. And the roofer's yelling at him, and he goes, hey, you talk to my union guy. Oh, we're just like, nope, not dealing with it. Um, so when you have large refrigerated cold storage buildings, you're gonna have a maze of ammonia pipes on the roof. I mean, and if you've ever tried to walk through that maze as someone over six feet, it's because you, you can't go over them, you got to go under them. And there's just dozens, of, it's a pain in the butt. Um, so when you're installing these, they usually tack weld the frames. I got some pictures of the frames I'll show you in a little bit. And even the best welder will still, with arc welding, sparks will still go and they'll burn a hole in the membrane. And guess what? Now vapor, uh, we've, we've breached not only the roof for liquid water, vapor retarders breach too. So you gotta inspect before and after HVAC contractors go through. Um, air leaks to the problem. There's an, I wrote an article in Professional Roofing 2019. If you're looking for examples of these details, and what, there's a bunch of them in there. So this train wreck was in Louisiana. This moron, and I'll use that term, that's as nice as I can be about this guy. He bought a refrigerated building, was storing the school district's milk. School district built a new building. Mr. Entrepreneur goes, well, I'm gonna turn this into my seafood distribution center. So he hires a refrigeration contractor, drops the temperature from 36 to minus 10. Didn't do anything to the building. Just starts pumping heat out. In Louisiana, little, little humid down there, right? And so all of the, and so there's double T's to make up the roof structure. And so you've got these metal, just galvanized sheet up against there and a roof up here. And now you got an airspace. They started getting frost formation and, and icicles forming. This genius reads on the internet that you can vent moisture out of a roof system. So he puts 50 holes on each side of his building with louvers. Straight out of Home Depot, just louver vents. And just thought, oh, I'll just let the air pass through between my ceiling and my insulated roof. I got the call because he started blaming the roof for leaking because now ice was forming and the entire panels were falling down full of ice. He tried sealing with great stuff. Um, <laughs> just everywhere. This idiot actually changed the slope of his roof. How? Frost heave. <laughs> In Louisiana, because it was an exterior walls and one column line down the middle of the building for these double T's, it actually frost heaved in the middle of the building and changed the slope of his roof. And now it held water and he blamed the roof for that too. Yeah, he, he, he was a smart one. 
we've all met that person that does like eight different things and they're terrible at all of them. Well, I've got a recycling business, I got a contracting, I got a home security business, and they're terrible at all of them. This guy was like that. He had another building next door that he had like RVs and old arcade jukeboxes and ugh. yeah, just more and more. And it was all, it was like rolling over the seafood and everything. You're just like, no. So this is a refrigerator building. They were having condensate leakage. One of the bigger names in roofing in the country had done this roof. The problem was they brought in three supervisors and then hired day labor from the local jail. Did they miss some things? Yeah. So this penetration through the concrete deck should have been foam solid. Should look more like that. No air movement, I mean, we'd seal the air, air seal. Didn't happen, constant, easy fix, but to go to every single one of these now on the roof was gonna cost, I think it was like $80,000, plus some other issues. All right, what else? Oh, air seals. So this is in between a loading dock and the freezer area. Loading dock was at 55, freezer's at minus 10. We put an air seal in the roof system. Remember I said before about those self, or the drying roof system? Same thing, we want to prevent air from moving from 55 degrees to minus 10. So we put an air stop in the roof system itself. Simple enough, just drop the membrane down to the deck and then start the next roof system. This is a PVC system, we can just weld the membranes together. You wouldn't even know it's there walking over the top of it. So, and there's a sealant there and we're gonna put fasteners through it. Worst grade, those details are in the article. Uh, this is one of those ammonia stands. They're getting ready to weld. They put the welding mats down. Uh, but like I said, even the best welders I've seen, they're going to let a spark or two go and not see it, and it lands outside those mats and melts a hole in the roof. It just happens. That's, that's looking down one of those pipes, and there can be dozens of those crisscrossing the roof. Um, so they, they literally are going to weld thousands of these stands. So you got to inspect afterwards for the burn holes. All right, we're nearing the end, and we're gonna get you to lunch right on time, I hope. Look at that. All right, beware the cheapest roof. About once or twice a year, I get the call, either from the roofer or their lawyer. I, an owner asked me to put the cheapest roof I could put down, you know, some, we, we've all probably met that building owner too, and so I did it, and now they're wanting to sue me. Can you go out, Matt, and look at this thing and write a letter saying everything's fine? No. <laughs> the last one of these I did in the fall, and I went out, looked at it, and two days later, I had a conference call with his attorney, and the guy charged 130,000 to put the roof on, and the owner still owed him 30,000. He was gonna sue the owner for the 30. And my advice to them was, run. Can't, you know, settle, just dismiss the lawsuit and hope they don't sue you. And he's like, I don't, well, I'm like, hear me, don't chase this. You, somebody like me is gonna come in for them and you're gonna get nicked. It's probably gonna cost you 100,000 to fix this. That's what happened. One of the guys I see on the, these apartment roofs all the time, he said, hey, hey were you on that? I never even sent a bill. I don't even want my name attached to it. And he said, I heard you were on this roof, you know, this one roof. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I, I didn't even send him a bill. He goes, I wouldn't have either. My God, you know, he was working for the owner and it was, all I want to say is if you're going to do that, or if you're the designer and they're asking you to do something stupid and cheap, get it in writing. Get that smoking gun email or letter saying, yeah, I know. I want you to put the cheapest roof down because oh, too often, give me the cheapest roof. And that SOB turns around and sues you because, you know, they asked for the cheapest roof and they got what they paid for. I, it just, ha I mean, it's, it, I've run into them over and over again where you're just going, who the hell put this down? It just, you know, code non-existent this and drainage maybe. Um, and it just always winds up poorly. I, I don't like getting involved with them. So please don't do it or get the smoking gun and go, look, you told me to. Goodbye. So, that's, what, that's one of the cheapest, 
they skimped on adhesive. This is an adhered roof system. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. So this. So anyway, so that's not that is not fully adhered, sir. That is not fully adhered. No, I said my close by is fully adhered. Okay. Yeah. If you're st somebody walked on top of that in the wind, and I was like, get the because you're going to go like one of those buckets of adhesive. <laughs> They're like, look, it's a trampoline. I'm like, get off, get. Um, so we've talked about concrete refs, uh, concrete roof decks. Uh, use a vapor retarder. You know, check with the manufacturer. They will have a preferred system on what they want to do. Uh, vapor retarders themselves, generally not a problem. That SBS I showed you that peeled like a post-it note, one, we were, we were abusing that. I'll admit it. I mean, we were pushing vapor for an entire year straight. Secondly, I asked the best mod bit guy I know, who currently is running Suprema, and he, he looked at it with a little southern draw, and he goes, eh, you put too much primer on that. I think you smooth, you know, that primer filled in all the little nooks and crannies, and so it just wasn't able to bond mechanically into the concrete. Okay, maybe. But we showed that, you know, when installed correctly, to, that was uh, mag-floated concrete. I cry probably like number three or something. Stuck just fine. 300 or up over 1,000, even 2,000 pounds per square foot of uplift. You can dry a wet roof with desiccator, there's, it's possible. So if you got that special situation where you need to, you can, it's possible. I think we talked the, that apartment situation to death. Please don't do it, just put, even sneak a couple inches of insulation and it's insurance. You won't have any problems. Even, even in Canada, I would bet it would work. It's not that much colder in Canada than it is in Wisconsin, Michigan. Um, until you get above that Arctic Circle, then change, things change. But if you're building a building like that above the Arctic Circle, you need to have your head examined. Um, I'm just saying, I mean, I, you got to build it a little tougher, you know, above, when you get that damn cold. Uh, prefab, I think we're still open to debate exactly what's going on there, but it's part of the debate that needs to be opened about air control, because HVAC, air control layers, um, you know, even the self-adhering tapes on those things after a couple of years, I've just seen them sitting there sagging and falling off. And then the, the owner's going, well, that should stick. It's like, well, you should get up there and maintain your building um, back and forth. But I think we need to start that discussion in the building science community for those types of buildings. Cold storage, there's just a way to build them. And there are certain contractors who know how to build them. Um, find them, use them. And don't build the cheapest damn roof. All right, short plug here. The University of Wisconsin has put on a roofing, low slope roofing class for over 40 years now. It happens after Thanksgiving every year. Um, I know Joe was there, I think three, four years ago. Um, very well liked, everyone learns a lot. We've decided this year to add an advanced course. So there's a fundamentals that we're going to revamp all the subjects and PowerPoints, but we're going to add an advanced course. So if you liked what you heard and some of the nerdy stuff, we're going to do more of that. So look for uh, that advanced course if you're interested in it. Besides that, thank you very much. Let's have some lunch. I'll take any extra questions. All right, let's uh, meet back here at uh,